But if you have your Bibles with you today, if you just turn to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, that's Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and um, if you just hold it there. Now, many of us, if we understand who God is, we understand that God is a God that owns everything. We know that. If you read the Bible, you will see that God created man, God created every single thing in this world beyond what man will try to claim. Exodus declares that all the earth is his. Psalms declares that he owns a thousand cattle on a thousand hill. The world is his and the fullness thereof. He doesn't need to take our livestock or bulls. If he was hungry, he doesn't need to tell us. He doesn't need us to feed him. So we know that God is not somebody that needs really anything from us. There's nothing that you can really give to God to say, you know what, God, I'm going to give you this because God is somehow in need. God is not in lack. Really, there's nothing that you can... Just say it more time. There's nothing that you can really even add to God. God is God all alone. We sing that song, you know, God is... I don't know exactly the words, but we sing that song that God is God alone. You know, he was there from the very beginning. So there's nothing that we can add to God. It's not like God is saying, you know what? You need to give me something to make me who I am. Many of us, we need things added to us to make us who we are. But there's absolutely nothing that you need to give to God. And I want to make that clear. Not that we are not important to God, but God is God all alone. Regardless of whether we are here or not, God has always been God from the beginning. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, regardless of our existence or not. Yet, paradoxically, it seems that God does want a lot from us. It seems that God actually wants a great deal from us. So how do you reconcile a God who doesn't need nothing, but yet a God who seemingly needs everything from us? If you've been coming church long enough, you know that perhaps... God wants my money. Tithes, offerings. Zori just did an illustration that we need to give to God. We know that God wants our time. Many of us Wednesday night trekking here with our children thinking, man, I'm tired. I could actually be at home today. Got work tomorrow, maybe put the children to bed. So we're saying to ourselves, for well, God that doesn't need anything, why does he seem to want so much from us. See, when you got the revelation of who God is, I remember when I came to church and I come from a Jehovah's Witness background and in the Jehovah's Witness church, it's very much, you do this, you do that, and you kind of go through the levels and it's quite religious. But when I came to this church, someone told me that you need to live for Jesus. You need to give your life to God. And I'm thinking to myself, that's just madness. You want me to give up my life my will to God, and I'm thinking to myself, that's too much. And many of us here have come to that place where we're saying to ourselves, you know what? God is asking a lot of me. But yet, the Bible tells us that God doesn't need nothing. So why does he want my time, my money? See, I believe that it's very important for us to understand these two paradoxes, these two different sides to God. If we're truly going to understand who God is. And it's sometimes in the most difficult of scriptures or sometimes seemingly confusing that we get a deep understanding of the God that we serve. So if you've got your Bibles and you're holding it at Genesis 22, I just want to read a few verses, starting from Genesis 22. And many of us who have your Bible, and it's, it's quite a familiar one. It's the testing of Abraham. And it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you have, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Verses 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship God, we will worship and then we will come 
back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his, on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together, verses 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, verses 10, and nearly there. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, and he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son. I'm just going to stop there. We can catch up um, a few verses after. Now, allow me to just build a little bit of foundation here. If you're watching the line, probably not a lot of us, but get yourself comfy. If you're in here, just relax. You know, we're going to have church. We've come to hear the word of God. You know, let's, let's just keep our mind, forget the day that's gone ahead. You know, I believe that God definitely want to speak to us, so let's just engage. Now, many of us know the story of Abraham and Isaac. And if you don't, we've just read it there. Now, in Jewish tradition, it's known as the Akedah, or the binding of Isaac. And as I said, many of us know, Sarah and Abraham could not have children. She was barren. Abraham was an old man. They were both very, they were both old to be honest. But God had called Abraham from his country and said that he would be a great nation. He would make a great nation from Abraham. He would give him a son. Now we know that he could not conceive. If you read through the scripture of Genesis, just before this in 21, we see that promise came to pass. Abraham had a son. We know that he had a son by Hagar who was um, Sarah's slave girl, Ishmael. And as we know, Ishmael was not the promised son, regardless of what Muslims will try to claim. The promise has always been through Isaac that would actually come from Sarah and, um, and Abraham. Now we pick up the story, as we just read in Genesis 22, where Isaac is a little bit older now, time has gone on. Ishmael has left the house, we know the story, you can read it. There was tension within the house between Ishmael, between Abraham's um, son Isaac. Now Ishmael is about 13 years old, scholars say he's about 13, year, 13 years old at this point that we pick it up. So when you turn a chapter, you've turned years. Now Isaac's name itself is quite important and I'm sure um, Nathan you know, I mean, he would, he would know the name. But it does um, evolve around the word laughter. You know, because when God told Ava, um, like Sarah that she have a child, she laughed. And it talks about joy, it talks about laughter. And after all, he was the promised child that they wanted. So if you can imagine from being barren to having a child, nearly dead, the Bible said that Abraham and Sarah was. A child at this stage would bring joy. Many of us have had children, me recently, and the birth of a child always brings joy, some pain, as many of us know, but there's a lot of joy as well. But then what happens is, is the God who needs nothing, the God who doesn't need you and I, the God that owns everything, comes to Sarah and Abraham and says, I want to take everything that you have. That son that you love, that son that you always wanted, I want you to take him and give it to me as a burnt offering. The God who owns everything seems to want to take everything away from Abraham. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Now, those who are thinking that God allows sacrifice or child sacrifice, if you read anything in the scripture, we know that that's a, 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 a abhorrent to God. We know how God feels about that. 
So this wasn't really about child sacrifice. Because the Bible and the author makes it clear that God was testing Abraham's faith. Of course, Abraham didn't know that. And I think it's important as well to address the, the, the point about that. Because many people will say, you know what, why does God test? Why does God test us? It seems a bit cruel that God needs to test us. Well, how many of us here can drive? How many of us here passed our tests? About some of you, man, got some dodgy little trust. I need to bear you in a row. So I don't know how you passed. But the reality is, for you to be approved of anything, for you to have a qualification, you need some kind of testing because it shows you're capable of doing what you say that you're doing. When you go to the doctor, you want to know that that doctor has some qualifications. You want to know that that doctor has gone through some lessons and they've learned something. They've gone to university, they've studied. You want to see some diplomas written on the back of the wall. You don't want to go to a doctor and just say, you know what, I'm just trying a thing. Don't worry, you can trust me. You want to know that doctor is accredited, or you should do. And so, when it comes to the kingdom of God, whoever God is going to use and call, God is going to make sure that they're tested and fit for the call in itself. 1 Timothy 3.10 says that deacons first must be tested and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. But I want to shift gears tonight, church. Because I believe that there's some of us in this room who have Isaacs in our lives. And I'm not just talking about Azariah and Nathan tonight. Those that are watching online, there are things in our lives that bring us joy. There's things in our lives that make us smile. And there's things in our lives that mean so much to us. But the question is, what would you do if God comes and asks you and told you to give it to him? What are you going to do when a God who needs nothing comes to you and say, that thing that's in your life, I want it, give it to me. That thing that gives you security, that thing that gives you happiness, make us content, it's something that we've always wanted, we think it's our future. What are we going to do when a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob comes to us? And for some of us, it could be money, employment, a job, relationships, people in our lives, businesses, things that matter so much to us that it can almost define who we are. You see, what if God comes and asks you, I want you to give that to me, and I want you to make a burnt offering on my altar. You see, to understand what God was asking Abraham, you need to understand what a burnt offering is. You see, when God, a burnt offering, there's many different types of offering, but a burnt offering was when they took an animal, different types of animals, but they took an animal, brought it to the altar, brought it to the priest, and this thing will burn on the altar. Some other offerings, the priest would normally take some of it for themselves. But in terms of a burnt offering, you're going to put that on the altar. Maybe it's an animal, whatever it is, and you're going to leave it there till it burns crisp. It's an offering to God only. You don't get any of it. It's all 100% for God. So God is asking you, whatever it is, 100% is mine. You can't take anything back from this. You're not going to get anything back out of this. You're going to watch it burn on the altar and you're going to leave it there. A burnt offering means to ascend, literally to go up in smoke. Now, we don't carry our burnt offerings today, obviously. But sometimes, when we give some things to God, are we hesitant? When God asks us for something, are we hesitant because we say to us, oh, boy, listen, if I give it to God, you know, I ain't going to get that back. If I give this thing to God, that means so much to me, so much laughter, so much joy, could I actually give this to God? Because
because I know I ain't gonna, I probably ain't going to give it back. Once it goes to God, it's burnt, done, crisp. I ain't going to get this thing back. And so we wrestle, we say, can I actually give this thing up? Can I give this person up? Can I give this relationship up? Can I give my hard-earned resources to God? Can I give my life to God? You see, I know this is a reality because before I was saved, and when someone asked me, let me put it this way, you know when you go on outreach and you ask someone to say the answer, to say you're like, he's talking to someone, having a good conversation, yeah man, believe in God, yeah, yeah, your conversation's flowing, yeah, I used to go to church, yeah, I do this, you know, yeah, I believe in God, of course, man, you know, and then you come to the point where you say to them, all right, do you want to pray? Do you want to say the sinner's prayer? And you try to articulate that to the best you can. And then the conversation changes. There's a hesitancy. It's almost like, well, you know what? Um, I'm just not ready. I'm, you know what? Yeah, I, I, you know, I believe. I believe in God. I believe God is real. But you know, I'm just not. You know, I, I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready. I'm not there. I've got a couple of things I need to sort out first. Let me try and sort this out. I've got a lot of things that's going on in my life. You see what people are doing. Is they're saying to themselves, God is asking me for my Isaac. That girlfriend, well, I don't know if I can give her up. I know what God is asking me. Living clean, I don't know if I can do that. God wants my money. Every single church, God wants my money. No, I ain't going to tie, I'm going to give my money to God. And people at that moment were saying to themselves, wrestling in their hearts, I think God wants my Isaac. They don't articulate it like that. They don't say it like that. But what they're saying is, God wants a lot from me and I know it. God wants everything from me and I know it. And the situation that I'm in in the moment, if I'm honest, I don't want to give it to God. The things that make me happy, my eyes out, the things that make me laugh, the things that brings me joy, I don't want to give it up. I want to keep it. Because I know once I come to church, once I give it to God, it's gone. It's going to be like a burnt offering. I'm never going to see it again. See, I know this. Because I was once on the other side of that question. So I'm not speaking from a person who don't know. When I came to Jesus, there were many things in my life that I thought I was going to lose. There were many things that I felt, man, God is going to take this. Man, I'm never going to get that back. My fun, my joy, my girlfriend, my life. My will. God is going to take my will. I understood that. I didn't know how to articulate it, but something in me knew. Something was forcing me. Something, I knew I had to change. I knew there's going to be changes, no doubt about it. And I said to myself, I don't want to change. I like my life the way it is. And I don't want to give up my eyes out. It's who I am. It's what makes me complete. It was, it's what brings me joy. I can't exchange that for nothing. And I will say this, that when we deal with people, when we talk to people, be very conscious that we're not just saying a prayer with them. We're not just saying, I'll come to church. You're asking people many times to make the most difficult decision in their lives. If they're very conscious, I have to give up things in exchange for God. I have to give up my life for God. It's not an easy thing. But the reality is, listen, I'm not here to preach to sinners tonight. I'm not here to preach to the agnostic or the atheist. You see, Abraham wasn't a sinner. Abraham was a man of God. So I'm here tonight to talk to Christians. I'm going to ask the same question to Christians. How do we respond when God asks you to bring your eyes out to the altar? Things in our lives that we think to ourselves, man, I don't want to give that up. I don't know if I can give it all to God. I don't know if I can surrender my whole life to God. Are we panicked? You know them, you know them, them challenging sermons, that boy, them sermons you wish you never was in that building. 
You know them sermons where the pastor's preaching, you're thinking to yourself, man, I missed that one. People are powerful, God challenged me like, wait, no, I'm glad I wasn't there, man. I didn't need that at the moment. It's like once you become a Christian, there's no turning back. Many of us have never seen the film The Matrix. When the man wanted to be plugged back into the Matrix. You see, once you see the real world, there's no turning back. Once you know the truth, there's no turning back. And for many of us, we don't want to cross that line. You see, there are men, women in this place, myself included, who you know that God has called you to something, but you say to yourself, man, God looking to kill me now. If I answer that call, man, my life is finished. If I go out, man, listen, my life is done. I'm going to give up my whole life on this altar. That's my whole life. My children, my family, my wife, my life, my way. I have to go to some other city. I have to lay down my whole life for other people, for God's kingdom. And that's a real issue. But how did Abraham respond to God? Did he run away? Did he make excuses? Verse 3 tells us Abraham's response. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out from the place God had told him about. You see, Abraham's reaction was one of obedience. Obedience means to listen to him. See, God just said something to Abraham, and Abraham responded to God. You see, you know what had, you know what disobedience is. Many of us have children. You say it hundreds, hundred times to them: stop, do this, do that, don't listen. Disobedience. But when God asks us to do something that we're not too sure about. That's a bit challenging, that's a bit hard, that's a bit risky. I don't know. See, our response shouldn't be one of running away. Our response should be one, you know what, God? I'm going to trust you. You see, Abraham's response signifies a relationship with God. You see, when God was speaking to Abraham, Abraham responded he had a relationship and relationship means that there's a trust involved in other words there was a faith there was already a faith in God now many of us will think to ourselves man listen Abraham's called the father of faith but if you read your scripture you realize that Abraham wasn't that faithful when he went to Egypt did he trust God to look after his wife no, he didn't. He said, this is my sister because I fear that the Egyptians will kill me because she's beautiful. He never trusted God. When God made a promise that he would have a child, did Abraham trust God? No, he didn't. Sarah said to go into Hagar. That wasn't what God said. You see, even a man of faith that we look upon today would say the father of faith had doubts. He had issues. He wasn't just, yeah, whatever God says, I trust God. No, Abraham battled in the same areas as us. Even Abraham's faith was tested. It's not easy to just trust God straight away. It's, it's a process. But God still worked with Abraham, even in his doubts, even in his failures, as you want to call them, even in his disobedience, God still worked with Abraham. And that should give us hope tonight that, listen, I'm not saying we need to be perfect. We don't have to have the perfect faith. We don't have to trust God in everything. But you realize that God is always willing to work with us where we're at. You see, it's very easy sometimes to trust God. And I'm going to flip it. You see, sometimes when you don't have anything, God help me this job. God help me get a husband. God help me get a wife. God help me with this. Whatever it might be that you're asking God to help you with. And you trust God. You ask God. We pray, God heal me. 
God deliver me. God, all of these things we come to God and we say to God, God, we know that you're a God that hears. We stand up here, Zori just prayed. We know that it's a God that hears our prayers. So we come to God and we pray, we, say, we make our petitions. And the Bible tells us to. But can we trust God with the things that he gives us? Or do we only trust God to give us things? Can we trust God? God has given us a job. Can we trust God? When the pastor says, oh, you know, bless the kingdom. Nah. That's mine. You see, it's very easy. God give me. But when God says, can you give me back? Nah. That's mine. You see, when God gave Isaac, he could have said, no, that's mine. You gave me that. How am I going to have children now? You told me. You already kicked out Ishmael. Now I've got one child left. I'm already 100 years old. Sarah's already nearly dead. And now you're asking me back to give you Isaac. That don't make no sense. But as you saw from his response, he trusted God. Can we trust God? the things that he has given to us. You see, Abraham's response was yes. He went and gathered sticks. He went and gathered sticks. He just said, listen, let's go. I'm all in. We're going up. Isaac, getting things ready. God has told us we're going up. He said to his servants, let's go. Abraham in our text says that he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. See, Abraham believed that he would come back with his son. That even though that God had asked him to sacrifice him, somehow he would return with his son. See, when we give to the kingdom, do we truly believe the scripture that it will be returned back to us? Pressed down, shaken together, running over. We sing those songs, but do we believe that when we give of ourselves, of our times, of our resources, do we actually believe that it's going to come back to us? Or do we think to ourselves, it's gone. Never to be seen again. When we lay down our lives for the kingdom, do we believe that it will going to be burnt out? mashed up, lives are gone. Do we trust God? You know, even like parents, women, I know, listen, I've got three now. And it's difficult sending them out into the world, listen, I know. Even to school. But we can trust God with our children. We can trust God when they go out, when they're not with us. We can ask God to choose their friends, to choose their classmates, to choose their spouses. I know they're young, but listen, we can ask God from now. Those of us who have children, who are a little bit older, who might not be saved, or relatives, or whoever it might be, you can trust God for their lives. Pray to God about it, maybe God will save them. God loves your children more than you do. Trust me, I know. You see, Abraham had no idea how Isaac was going to come back to him. But it wasn't Abraham's work problem to worry about. You see, we don't know how everything's going to work out, but that's not our problem. That's God's problem. Our role is to trust God. Our role is to put faith in God. We don't have to worry about how it's going to work out and how this is going to happen, how the next problem, we don't need to worry about any of that. We just need to trust God. You see, when I trust someone, I don't worry about what they're going to do. I trust them. If I come to you and I say, if I have a friend and I say, I trust my friend with this thing, I'm not going to say, oh, bro, how are you going to take care of that? But let me know the plan. What are you going to do? Um, you know, you start panicking. No, I just give it to him and say, listen, he's my friend. I trust him. I'm going to relax in that. He now has the responsibility to carry out whatever task he needs to carry out because the trust is on him now. It's not on me. I don't need to be fretting and thinking, man, what's this guy going to do? When God asks us to trust him with something, we don't have to worry about how it's going to work out. 
Don't stress yourself and thinking, man, how's this going to happen? How am I going to get this job? How am I going to get this house? How is this going to be happen? How is this issue in my life going to be worked out? How am I going to get this money? How am I going to get married? How are all of these things going to work out? Don't worry about that. Your job is to trust God. His job is to do the other part because he's got the part that you can't do. If you can do it, then forget it. See, it's always God's role to carry the weight. Our role is just to trust him. All Abraham did was obey. See, listen, church, God sees our sacrifices and our struggles, our labors, our struggles, and he sees the trust that we have in him. You don't have to worry about it. God sees everything that you're going through, all the issues and the battles and the stresses. God sees it. See, in our text, Abraham continued and he tied up Isaac and he was about to take his life. The Bible said he was tied up and the knife was coming down. There was no doubt in Abraham's mind. He wasn't like, oh, oh, oh God, are you, are you, are you gonna, are, is God going to come through? There wasn't a trial of, you know, he just hit it there. Man, God didn't come through. Let me hit a bit. God, I'm going to do it now. God, I'm going to kill it. God, I'm going to do it. Is God going to come? He didn't do none of that. He wasn't pondering. He wasn't questioning. He wasn't doubting. He just tied him up, took the knife, and went bang, straight. And then God in that moment called out from heaven. And he said to him, Abraham, Abraham. Same thing he said to him before. He said, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. You see, God got involved, church. And Abraham passed the test. You see, the phrase to fear God is not like, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of God. I'm worried, I'm concerned. Really what the, what the text is saying is God is saying that now that I know that you trust me, Abraham. Now that I know that you reverence me. Now that I know that you have a trust in me, Abraham. It's all about faith. God realized that Abraham had faith in him. Because he trusted him with the thing that was most precious to him. His son. And no harm came to his son. So the encouragement for us tonight is whatever God is asking you to trust him with, I don't know. But I know that God is asking people to trust him with things. People, finances, ultimately at the end of the day it's our lives. Can we trust God with our lives or not? I will say yes. I don't know what you're going to say, but I believe that you would say yes with me. Can we trust God with our lives? Can we trust God with the most precious things in our lives? You see, the reason why this is important is because your very salvation, your whole destiny of God is hinged on that. You see, God said, now I know. And this conveyed a deeper relationship as God's response to Abraham's trust and obedience in him. See, God wasn't just thinking, can I trust Abraham? God needed to know if Abraham was trustworthy. And God saw that he was. Because Abraham was able to look past the gift and onto the giver. See, this is what faith is. Faith is trusting in the giver, not just what he gives you. It's the giver who supplies all you need, all you want, all you ever need, not the gift. It's not the gift that brings you joy. It's not the gift that makes you content. It's not the actual thing that you're asking for. It's the one who gives it. You see, everything you're gonna receive from God is always gonna be temporary. Every single thing, your children, your marriage, your finances, you can't take anything with you. 
only thing that's eternal is God. The only thing that's going to last is God himself. The only thing that's not perishable. You see, and as we read our text and as we close tonight, we see that God provided. God didn't just stop, but he provided a ram for Abraham. See, our text tells us that Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. See, the ram was not only proof of provision to Abraham, it was a symbol of God's provision for generations to come, which ultimately pointed to Christ and his sacrifice for our sins. Even though Abraham's son was spared, God's own son would not be. See, God never asked us to do something he hasn't done or would not do. See, Abraham learned that God is not only a blesser, not only that he can be trusted, but that he's a provider. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And this is where we get the name Jehovah Jireh, my provider. See, but this is not the end, church. It gets even better. See, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven the second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all the nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. See, not only did God provide, not only did God prove his faithfulness, but by trusting God and releasing his son, Abraham gained a multitude of sons and daughters. See, sometimes when we're holding on to things, sometimes when we're panicked and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, I can't really trust God with this. I can't really trust God with this one thing. Or maybe it's even multiple things. But you don't know what God has for you by you just releasing that one thing to God. The scripture, the scripture, the scripture tells us that Abraham had became the father of many nations. He didn't even actually lose his son. He still had his son Isaac, as we know, but he gained even more. And this is where I want us to end on tonight, church. If you want to know that God is a provider, that God is faithful to his word, I want to do a little experiment. If you just look over to your left and to your right, probably not Julian, probably to the other side. You see some people sitting next to you, hopefully. Or you can look at the back. Or you can at least look at me. What you're looking at is a child of Abraham. What you're looking at is that God was faithful to his promise. Every single individual sitting in here is a descendant of Abraham by faith through Jesus Christ. Every single person sitting in here is a fulfillment of that promise that God made to Abraham thousands of years ago. You are here because Abraham was faithful and he had many descendants in the Bible says that he could not even count. I'm not going to count you guys here today but you are one of his descendants. See, God is faithful to keep his promises. You can trust God with everything that you have. See, the reality is, and the funny thing is, is that God doesn't actually want to take anything from you. I said in the beginning, what does God actually, God doesn't need anything from you. You see, the thing is, God actually, rather than taking, God actually wants to add to your life. You see, when God called Abraham, his name was just Abraham. And when God called Sarah, Sariah, I can't remember what Sarah's name was, but her name was Les. Yeah. But when they came to God, his name was changed to Abraham. And it means something. You see, Abraham meant exalted father, and Sariah meant princess. When they came to God, God changed their names. 
Abraham became the father of many, and Sarai became the princess of many. I say this because many of us, before we came to church, and I don't mean no disrespect, we were a little bit less than what we are now. For many of us, we came to church, we was just Julie, as talented as he was as a footballer, but now he's Junic, the father and husband, the father of Gabriel, Gab Gabriela, and the husband of tomorrow. You see, before many of us came to God, we were just Keith. But now it's Keith, the father, and the husband of two children and a wife. Before I came to God, my name was always Nafferty, didn't add on anything, any, any extra letters. But what I did add, or what not I did add, what God did add, was three children and a beautiful wife. And there's many more things I can list off. See, I can go through all the names tonight, but you will know within yourself, as I look around, there's many of you that's come into this place that there was something lacking in your life. There was something missing. And as you become a Christian, as you've gone through the years, God has changed your name, not physically, but spiritually. There's been things, physically and spiritually, added to you. Do you see those things that God has added to your life? Or do you still think that God wants to take everything that you have? Have you gone through and you've laid down your life? Have you given up your Isaac? Has your life gotten better or has it gotten worse? Have you lost or have you gained? I know I've gained. I know without God, I wouldn't be the man standing here today. I don't know if I'd be half the man or quarter the man. I don't know where I'd be if I'm honest. But what you see standing here today is not how I came into the kingdom. Everything that you see here today has been added to me. Because God is a God that adds to you. He's not looking to take from you. He's not looking to just take your Isaac and your life and all these things. He's looking to add to your life. As I say to many people, you have no idea what God is looking to add to your life. But for many of us, we say, no, I don't want to give him my Isaac. I'm too scared. And you walk away and you close God. You shut out your destiny and say, God, I'm walking away. And you leave with what you have, not realizing was how much God has for you. So many of us in this place, God has added so much. And there's so much more that he wants to add to your life. But do you trust him? Do you trust God with the thing that's so much that's most precious to you? Can we trust God, church? Can we trust God? Is God trustworthy? Is God Jehovah Jireh? Is God our provider? Can God be trusted or not? You need to come to the place where you can say, God can be trusted with everything that I have. Because you trust him with your very soul. You have no idea what's going to happen to you when you die. Reality. It's all by faith. And you're trusting God trust in Jesus that he has my soul in his hand if you can trust God with your soul that's the most precious thing that you have don't tell me you can't trust God with your boyfriend or your girlfriend don't tell me you can't trust God with your baby or your money there's nothing more precious than your soul and God the Bible says gave I'm finished and I'm going to close up God gave his only begotten son Jesus Christ See, God gave what was most precious to him. God gave what was in the beginning. See, Jesus wasn't created in Mary's womb. Jesus always existed before we were ever thought of. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in union from eternity to eternity closest relationship you're ever going to find closer than a mother to her child no matter how much you think you love your child you can never love like God loves but the 
Bible says that God gave what was so precious to him and we're saying that we can't trust him. Can I just have every head bowed and every, head, and every eyes closed and every head bowed in the presence of God? Can we trust God? I went over a little bit longer than I wanted, but I definitely appreciate your time. Can we trust God, church? I think the answer is yes. I know because I've trusted God, and I'm going to have to trust God as my life goes on. As I get older and older, I'm going to have to trust God even more. But God is trustworthy. I don't know what you're battling.